I had pretty good feedback on the last video where I introduced a gentle notion of a vertex algebra. And I was really excited because potentially more people saw that video than people had ever heard of vertex algebras in the past. So that's pretty cool. Maybe we can make this field of study really popular doing something like this. So I also want to point out that since last time I found this other YouTube channel that's going through a very similar series um, involving vertex algebras from a string theory or physicist's point of view. So I'll put some information about that on the screen right now and it's going to be linked in the description. Okay, so now in this video we want to talk about the why of vertex algebras. So they're quite complicated. Why would someone define these to exist in the first place? We're going to look at a couple of reasons, but before we do that, I want to recall what our loose idea of a vertex algebra was from the last video. And I'll just say it like this. A vertex algebra is very loosely a simultaneous generalization of a commutative associative algebra and a Lie algebra. And so let's recall that there are infinitely many ways to take the product of two elements, and those are indexed by the integers. So here we could have the negative first multiplication of u and v, which we just denote with this subscript minus one here. And that's actually the, mul the multiplication that is closest to endowing this with the structure of a commutative associative algebra. And actually, in some cases, you do get a commutative associative algebra, um, but those cases are generally not that interesting. Then next, this zeroth multiplication, which we denote like u0v, that is the closest that endows this with the structure of a Lie algebra. So in other words, that operation is very close to being a Lie bracket. And then if you go up in that direction to u1, u2, so on and so forth, it's a further generalization of the Lie bracket. And then if you go down in that direction, it's like a further generalization of this commutative associative multiplication. Then furthermore, there's this special map T called the translation operator, which takes you down kind of deeper into the algebra. So you can think of like up here being the top of the algebra and this T is taking you deeper into it. There's this thing called the truncation condition, which I'm not gonna go into um, really carefully right now, but we'll see it later. And that says that at some point up here, you'll reach the top and it'll be zeros after that. So in other words, there is some n so that u n v is equal to zero for all n bigger than that n or whatever. So that's the top and then the T translation operator takes you deeper and deeper and deeper into this object. Okay, so now let's go ahead and get into the why, starting with a little bit of history. So the first thing that I wanna do is look at the notion of a simple group. And so that's gonna be a group with no non-trivial um, normal subgroup. And so why do we wanna call that a simple group? Well, it's a group that can't be simplified. Notice if you have a group and you have a normal subgroup inside of that group, you can form something called the quotient group. And so you have in some ways formed a simplification of the original group. So we can think about this as some sort of simplification of G. And well, it's a simplification of G by N. You're like quotienting out this N. But if there are no normal subgroups or no non-trivial normal subgroups, by which I mean other than the identity and the whole group, then the group is as simple as it can get already. So there are some standard infinite families of these simple groups, like Z mod PZ, where P is a prime. So that guy doesn't have any subgroups at all, let alone normal subgroups. And then uh, AN, the alternating group, where N is bigger than or equal to five. So that's a standard result from like an abstract algebra one class. You prove the simplicity of AN. Um, and there are more. There are some that are of Lie type, so they can be represented by matrices with entries from finite fields. So there are 26 more that do not lie in this list of families of simple groups, and those are called the sporadic simple groups.
And I guess I should say here that we're talking about finite simple groups. Um, and obviously if we're talking about finite simple groups and there are 26 sporadic finite simple groups, then there must be a largest one. And that largest one is called the monster. And so it's generally denoted by this like M, blackboard bold M. It's known as the monster group, sometimes as the friendly giant. That was actually one of its original names before it got this name, the monster group. And well, it's very big. So the order is about, so it's like around the size eight times 10 to the 53. So you can Google it real quick and see the exact order as a prime factorization. That's pretty easy to do, but needless to say, it's a very, very large group. And you might like think, well, okay, well, how can we describe it? There's like a bunch of different ways to describe it. And maybe there is one very natural way to describe it, and that is via vertex algebras, but we're not quite there yet. So for any group, there is something called a representation of a group, and there are these so-called irreducible representations. And the irreducible representations have certain dimensions. So if you look at the irreducible representations of the monster group, you get the following dimensions for those irreducible representations. So you get one, and then the next one is uh, 196,883. And then the next one is, let's see, two, one, two, uh, nine, six, eight, seven, six. And then maybe we'll write one more down. And so that last one, so that's like 842 million and then some other stuff. So that is one fact. And then the next fact is you can take this modular form. So it's called the J function and it has a so-called Q expansion. And this is a type of function that's like really important for analytic number theory. And if you do its Q expansion, it looks like this. So it's first one over Q plus one, nine, six, eight, eight, four, Q. So notice that's going to be one more than one, nine, six, eight, eight, three. And then there are some more. So I'll add two more terms. Okay, so I've written two more terms and I've given some names to these dimensions of the irreducible representations of the monster. So R1 is one, R2 is this 196,000 one, R3 is the next one, and R4 is the next one. Now it doesn't look like there's much link between the monster group and this J function yet, but if we notice that the coefficient of this thing is one, which is R1, then we can notice that the coefficient of this thing is R1 plus R2. Notice that's one more than 196,883. So that's like a trivial thing. And then the next one is going to be the sum of the first three. So R1 plus R2 plus R3. And then finally, this next one, it's not quite the sum of the first four, but it's gonna be two times the first one plus two times the second one plus R3 plus R4. So there is some kind of way to combine the representations or the dimension of the representations of the monster group in a linear way that you can get the coefficients of this J function. So Thompson looked at this and he said, oh, well, I mean, obviously this must mean that there is some sort of connection between the monster group and this number theoretic object, this analytic J function. And John Conway said, no, that's just moonshine. You're crazy. But it turns out there was, and that's the next part of our story. So here's a picture of that connection that we were hinting at on the last board. So here in the center, we've got the notion of vertex operator algebras and a special vertex operator algebra known as the moonshine module. We'll talk about that in just a second. But suffice it to say, there are, this is only one of many, many examples of vertex operator algebras. It just was like the first super famous one.
and it serves as a bridge between all of these subjects that don't look very connected. So first is the subject of group theory, really finite group theory, and the monster group like we discussed before. Next is this kind of geometric thing called the leech lattice. So that's a 24 dimensional lattice. It was recently shown that it is the lattice that allows for the closest sphere packing in 24 dimensions. So that's interesting as well. Next, there's this analytic number theory object, the analytic J function. So that's a modular form. Remember, modular forms were super important in proving Fermat's last theorem. And then next, there are these things from physics. So vertex operators for a bosonic string. And so that's actually how these things were motivated into definitions in the first place. There were some notions of vertex operators looming around in the string theory literature in the 80s. And Richard Borchards came along and said, hey, I'm going to take this and make a careful mathematical dis description of what's going on. And that ended up birthing the subject of vertex operator algebras. So now let's just talk about this a little bit. So Frankel Lepowski Merman, so FLM, they wrote this book, Vertex Operator Algebras and the Monster. And here was where they constructed this vertex operator algebra called the Moonshine Module, which is given by this V natural symbol. And the basic idea of this is you take a lattice and that lattice is the leech lattice. So the one that I was just talking about up there. And then from that, you form something called a lattice vertex algebra. So, you know, I intend to take this pretty far. So we'll look at the lattice construction. It is going to take a while, but we'll get there eventually. So you form this lattice vertex algebra VL. Then you form something called a twisted module for the, that lattice vertex algebra, which is, I'll call it VL, and then I'll put an upper T there, where T is an automorphism of order two. Then the next thing that you're going to do is take the direct sum of these two. And then finally, you're going to take the Z2 orbifold of those two. So again, we haven't really motivated what all of these things mean, but that's kind of the general construction for this um, V natural or this moonshine module. Okay, great. And the important thing here is that if you take the graded dimension of this moonshine module, you get the analytic J function. So let's maybe go ahead and write that in here. So graded dimension or sometimes character or it's sometimes also like the graded trace of something. So graded dimension of the moonshine module gives you this J function. And then furthermore, if you take the automorphism group of the moonshine module, you get the monster group. So that provides you this nice um, connection between these two ideas. And then Borchards proved something called the Conway-Norton conjecture. So let's write that down, Conway-Norton conjecture in uh, 1992, which was really some generalization of this picture up here. So instead of just having the graded dimension of this moonshine module and the analytic J function, it had to do with some other things attached to the moonshine module and some other modular forms other than the modular form J. And in fact, this netted him the Fields Medal in 1998. So that's like a nice historical spot for why vertex algebras were created in the first place. Maybe I'll go ahead and clean this up and we'll look at another nice application. Okay, so after vertex algebras were exploited to prove the Conway-Norton conjecture and their connection with the monster group and the J function were analyzed, then we saw that they had some more uses, and for one is the connection between Lie algebras and rogers ramanujan type identities, like the Gordon-Andrews identities and other uh, similar ones. So the basic picture goes like this. You start with a suitable Lie algebra, and then you form a vertex algebra that has the structure of a G hat module, and so that's a module of the corresponding affine Lie algebra.
And then next, you can take the graded dimension of that or the character or whatever, and you get something that looks like one side of a Rogers or Monogen identity or similar type identity, like the Gordon Andrews identity or so on and so forth. And there's actually been a lot of work in this like fairly recently, including with some twisted modules. And so maybe all of this started out with just taking the very simplest um, Lie algebra, which we talked about last time, so SL2. And then you go up here and look at the vertex algebra associated to the level one SL2 module. And I guess I should say SL2 hat module. So that's a pretty simple vertex algebra. We can maybe look at that in um, a forthcoming video. And then you take something called a principal subspace of that. And then you take the graded dimension of that principal subspace and you land at the Rogers Ramanujan identities. Then you can kind of do similar things for higher level SL2 modules or for like SLN modules at level one or even like twisted type modules. That's some stuff that's gone on recently as well. Okay, so I'll maybe go ahead and get rid of this and we'll look at one more thing. Now I wanna talk about some categorical stuff that's going on in the world of vertex algebras. So in category theory, there's a study of something called a modular tensor category. And so it turns out that if you take categories of modules of suitable vertex algebras, you get something called a, module, a modular tensor category. And furthermore, if you take categories of modules of certain quantum groups, you also get a modular tensor category. And the, there is some sort of correspondence between the module that you get over here and the module that you get over here, making some sort of relationship between the underlying vertex algebra and the underlying quantum group. And this is like a very interesting subject of study that's happening right now as well. And this is all kind of under the heading of looking at kajdan lustig correspondences. So we didn't really touch on how vertex algebras are related to algebraic geometry ideas or ideas from non-commutative geometry, but maybe we'll let that trickle in as we make more and more videos. And that's a good place to stop.